the rise of China, trade wars, COVID-19, negative interest rates. How will all this shape our future as we move towards 2030? Hi, I'm Justin Smirk, Senior Economist with Westpac Group. I'd like to thank Gary Northover and the team of Tractor Machinery Association for inviting me back to present to you our, our thoughts of the economic outlook and try and shape it around the agricultural industry as we're moving towards that big picture for 2013. Now, a lot of things have moved on since my presentation last year. Some of you remember I've been doing this now for almost 20 odd years. So I'm very happy to be back again, trying to give you sort of a bit of a wrap and synopsis of our thoughts about the near term and some of the implications for what we might think will happen for the longer term. If you remember rightly, back last year, um, we talked about some quite interesting facts that were unfolding. We're talking about the fact that the Chinese, European, US economies, or Japan, they're all slowing. The consumer was still quite robust and being the driving force, but the overall production and activity inflation rates were all below the long run averages. And on that basis, we saw the Fed remaining on hold. Global growth would be held robust by what's going on in Asia, and commodity prices overall be supported by this. And we also did highlight too that we thought the forecast for Australia are way too optimistic, and we thought the RBA would be cutting rates. And then, of course, we see the Australian dollar weakening through this period. Now, a lot of those events did come to come to fore. Those pressures were building, and then, of course, we got hit by COVID nineteen, and the whole situation changed. But those backdrops remain there. And those things will keep on being big factors going forward, even as we recover, we recover from this big shock of the COVID-19. Um, some of the big issues that we were facing that um, before COVID-19 were those sort of global settings in a state of flux. We're seeing the breakdown of, of, uni, of um, more panlateral uh, relationships for trade and working more around unilateral and bilateral relationships. And those kinds of events had been sort of putting pressure on the trade relationships. And that was going to be putting on an ongoing event. Uh, here in Australia, um, uh, we were looking at below trend growth. Household incomes were growing, not growing at all on a per capita basis. And purely consumption growth was being leveraged off strong population growth. And that is why we were concerned about growth rates and looking at the RBA and saying there'd be more rate cuts to come. And of course, what we're seeing beforehand as we're coming into the COVID-19 were some big shifts around, popu around popular ideals around um, global warming, climate change, the bushfires, and in, in, in fact, had a big impact on around that as well. And of course, the ongoing depth and spread of the drought that we saw through um, much of regional Australia was all shaping popular opinions in a very different way than perhaps that some people have been anticipating. So those backdrops are still there, and they're going to be a big part of this ongoing story that we think about as we move forward. So a big issue that's going to be in the backdrop of all these sort of discussions over at, as we move out towards 2030, of course, is going to be climate change. And in the backdrop of that is the, is, is the ongoing issues around water scarcity, and more importantly, how it's allocated around the world. This chart here is just trying to highlight the backdrop of major exporters of water. And you can see where people are major agricultural, ex agricultural producers and exporters. They tend to be the major exporters of water. Australia highlights as being a, a large net exporter of water. And of course, quite surprisingly, a country like India also is a net exporter. And even somewhere like China at the margin is one as two. So that goes to highlight that there's going to be some degree of stress and tensions and then you contrast it with areas such as Europe, which remain large importers. So the allocation of water, the access to water, when you think about the parts of the world that are doing this now, water has been basically fully allocated around the world in terms of what we can do to grow more agricultural production, how we, f how we water our cities, and how we keep industrial production going. And now the tension is going to remain in the environment of how we get access to clean water, and also who uses it and what we use it for. So today, with those sorts of backdrops we just spoke about, about the, the backdrop for the global economy, those issues around trade, those issues around um, water allocation, we now sort of break it down the presentation to four major components. What's going on in the global economy, what's happening around the rural agricultural communities, the Australian economy, and then we take a look at our forecasts and what they mean for the, what they sort of set for the near term, and then bring it together thinking about the more medium term and the risks there. Now, the global economy, it, without a doubt, the, um, this shock that we're getting from the COVID-19 is a, is a lifetime, once in a lifetime event. 
And realistically, it's something that we've never experienced since 1918. And even back then, the world was such a different place, it makes it very difficult to compare. What's really interesting about this shock is, given the magnitude of it and its impact it's had on growth, is the, the, is the, is the smaller impact it's actually had on global trade. This chart is just highlighting comparison towards the GFC, which through the contraction of trade finance had a material impact of, on global trade and could have been a key source of the evolution of a depression if they hadn't resolved the issues, to now where you've seen a much smaller impact around global trade. The orders indexes, Westpac's global trade index, hasn't reached any sort of levels down to as low as it did during the GFC, and it's already showing signs of recovery. While the industrial side, the production side, the PMI, the global manufacturing PMI, bounced, found base at a much lower level, much higher level of around 40, compared to a much deeper level of, of, go, of going down towards um, minus 35. And what we're looking at now is already signs of recovery coming through. So this shock, even though it's in impact on, on production, on, on GDP, on output, on the economies overall, is significantly larger than what we experienced during the GFC and perhaps the biggest shock we've experienced since the 1930s on trade side is much more modest. Straight away you can see where the tensions are going to lie and who can grow out of this, who can grow faster. Those economies more trade exposed will do better than those that are more service consumption based exposed. Those, those, those commodities and commodities that are linked towards more the production side and, and, and that sort of base consumption side will do better than those that are linked towards around consumption. And in that side there, what really stands out is energy, in particular oil. That demand is really linked strongly towards around consumer base, tourism, transporting of tourism goods, transporting of um, individuals around. All those things really map together and highlights why oil, pressure, oil prices have come under so much pressure compared to other commodities. Now, COVID-19, we would like to say that we've, we've reached the end of this, but as you can see, and as you've been, we've been reading quite a lot about the unfolding issues that are going around the US. Uh, US really hasn't got the situation under control. Um, some of the states such as New York put in tough measures which have brought under control. Even states which did tough measures as well, including California, are now seeing some further outbreaks and a further clampdown. States that tried to open too early in the South are now seeing a res resurrection of these, these problems. And this is where we're going to be seeing this ongoing, attempt, ongoing tension. We totally understand the issues around shutting economy down and, and bankrupting businesses and sending people unemployed to try and control a disease. But the flip side, as you're seeing, is what now is happening in the south of America, in the southern states of America, when you, when you don't go hard enough early enough, the disease lingers and the problems continue going on for longer and further, delaying the recovery and actually deepening the downturn that they're going to be experiencing. So there's this tension that's going to be tried to be managed all the way through. We can see from this point onwards, it's going to be very, very hard to do the kind of shutdowns we saw earlier in this year, around April and May. But it does mean the ongoing disruptions that we're going to be experiencing in the US economy and others will continue to remain a drag. You can see how the Chinese have managed to do quite well on controlling their situation. There's some doubt about the actual numbers, but the momentum is probably the correct one. But you also see the new rising issue in Latin America and how that could potentially to even exceed what we're seeing in the US. And while that their economic linkages is much smaller, it just highlights that the growing issue is not something that you can assume will go away tomorrow. And that's going to be a very, very important part of thinking about the recovery coming over the next couple of years. So our global growth profile, this, this is just really trying to highlight how you can see the nexus is moving. You can see there that the US is being hard hit. Their economy is falling around about 6% this year. China, which, is, which has had a much rapid, much harder shock earlier in the year and saw some more significant contractions, is actually having a much stronger rebound from it because of the way they've controlled it and allowed their economy open. We believe their economy, broadly speaking, will be flat through this year in an average terms. Big dip at the beginning, recovery that, and then looking at a very robust 10% recovery next year. That's why when you can talk about commodities that are linked towards China and the Chinese recovery, are going to outperform more so than ones that are also more broadly spread. Again, base metals, iron ore, agricultural goods that are linked towards Chinese demand compared to ones that are linked more towards US demand. Looking in, in, in further through too, you can also see the depth of the recession coming through in Europe 
down 8.5%, and their much more modest recovery, they're around 1.7%. You also notice with the US, even though it's collapsing 6%, they're getting 1.5%. Now contrast that with Australia and New Zealand, two countries which have put in the hard yards to really control the disease earlier and allowing a more progressive opening phase, notwithstanding the issues we're seeing currently in Victoria, but we basically seeing this how this momentum is, the contraction is past the worst, and the, re re and the instigation of the reopening of the economy has already started. We've seen the employment numbers already begin to stabilise and improve. There are many issues around the degree of fiscal support, which is helping mute the downturn and how it will be managed going out. We are making the assumption that the fiscal policies will be managed in such a way to smooth that. We won't have a December cliff. We will have adjustments around the, the structural payments here in Australia, but there'll be a smooth transitional phase rather than an abrupt removal. That will allow us to grow around 2.5%, and the New Zealanders, which are doing even better than us, more like 5 So you can see how now the nature of the global economy, COVID is having a lingering impact there. You've got the underlying fundamentals that were different to each economy going in and how they managed it is going to matter and how they come out as well. And also the degree of fiscal support that's been provided in the short run helps, to, it helps the, the level of recovery you get through the medium term. So for a nutshell, Australia and New Zealand are looking to outperform. If you wanted to think about relative interest rates or currencies, if our economy is outperforming in, in a real sense, that is an upside risk for both of those. Um, of course, this does have going to have a meaningful impact on the growth in Australia overall and where we are for the next few years. And one of the key ones is going to be, given the fact that we've had done very little around of growth per person in the last decade, very little around growing incomes per person through the last decade, it's all going to be around population growth. And we know even through historic, even without any change in policy, explicit change in policy, Rising unemployment, slower growth is always associated with lower levels of population growth. Of course, the borders are currently shut, and the assumption has to be that they remain shut for, an ex for a period of time through this year. But as we go through next year and moving on, you can see there will be some demand to come here, given quarantine conditions that will be attached to that, along with a desire to reopen our economy for some more growth. So we're talking about a much slower rate of growth of uh, population growth, around 1%. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainties around that, whether it actually could be this level or maybe a bit softer. But it is highlighting softer basic growth here in Australia, um, along with low income growth. We are going to have this really low, slow growth in an extended period in Australia for quite a while, once we've gone back, one gone past this bounce back from the shutdown. Um, now looking a bit more sort of back towards the subject that we're all here for today, talking about um, the rural and agricultural communities, we'll just step through some sort of big pictures. And one of the ones that I want to highlight is that agricultural commodities in a very, very broad sense have been left out of the more recent boom-bust cycles. They've had some their own little cyclical cycles around supply and demand, built a little bit of a kick around some of the changes in, in, in global demand. But overall, they've been relatively stable compared to the volatility in what we're seeing in terms of exchange traded commodities, that's you know, your base metals, your oils, your energies, and your bulk commodities, which is your coal and iron ore. You'll see that we are forecasting both of those other commodities to soften through this period of time. We're seeing this sort of big sort of surge in recovery right now that's sort of helping buoy those prices, but there's a lot of liquidity coming in that's sort of looking for a home that's been attracted to those sort of risk assets or giving some support fading through this year, but nothing really dramatic. It's just more of, like more of a modest cycle, but you can see that weakening price is coming through. Agricultural commodities, given the scales we've got in front of us, are broadly flat and a bit of an inflationary trend towards the end. Yes, there's going to be some cycles in there. There's going to be some seasonal factors for different commodities. Supply and demand conditions re remain sort of different. But overall, we're talking about, given the global growth profile, the ongoing growth that's in China and, and the in income, income growth there, we're talking about a very broadly flat cycle. So no real big changes there. It's going to be going forward from growth here. As always in agriculture, will be how we improve our productivity and efficiencies because the underlying fundamentals will remain much the same. There has been some really good news recently on the front, and I was only just updating this chart last night, and it surprised me in a very, very positive way. Why? Well, this chart just graphs the two different sorts of things I'll look at in agriculture over a longer-term perspective. The top line is output, 
And of course, you can see the impact of the more recent drought and how it's been long and extended and it's been dragging down on agricultural production. So our output's actually been reducing since 2015. Contrast that with the rise in employment in agriculture. This is a real change. Previously, in previous large deep um, droughts, we always saw a dip in employment as farmers adjusted to lower levels of output. As the, as the farming, as the output recovered, as the drought ended, farmers had learned to do more with less, less workers, and they normally held those levels. It was a structural change. It was a forced level of efficiency gain. This time we didn't see it. This time we've actually seen the opposite. There's been a downward trend in employment ever since the last drought in 2003. While there's been a trend upward lift in production, that's the rising productivity story. But more recently, we've seen the lift coming off through there. Um, you can see that it, 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 they've changed the nature of the um, industry here. And for a long time, part of the fear when we're talking about looking forward to 2030 was how are we going to find skilled labour to support the industry as we wanted to grow? This is actually suggesting we've seen an adjustment happen already. The industry is becoming more appealing. There's people moving back into the industry and the ability to attract and maintain young skilled labour is improving. Now, we'd have to dive the numbers and pull them apart a little bit more to get some feeling around it. But overall, as a big picture sense, for once I can come up here and positively say, we have got some good news story in, the, in a different trend for employment. It's setting the bedrock for an, in, for a, for an industry that can grow further and, and, and have the extra inputs to produce those extra outputs. So a good news story in the backdrop that we should be, should be, should be really applauding is the drought did not hit employment in agriculture. And despite the drought, we've lifted the level of people employment there, suggesting there is a confidence in the industry and confidence that we can build on going forward. And it's a very, very positive story and one I haven't seen for a while. Um, just quickly talking too about what we've been seeing in the near term, we have been seeing some disruptions around um, supply chains going into Asia, uh, particularly around, and we've seen some disruptions to the, to the demand supply chains around agricultural produce more generally. Um, the shutdowns of all the restaurants and hospitalities has had a meaningful impact, particularly like on red meats, seafoods. They've had to try and find new retail markets, which is very difficult in the short run. Um, we've also seen the seasonalities continue to play a major role in this. But overall, in the short run, we will see, be seeing the industry adjust. The, the um, hospitality retail industries are going to take a long time to recover back to previous levels. Focus around more sort of the industrial consumer side is going to be remain probably the key area of growth. And that sees, does suggest we're going to have this period of adjustment continuing for a little bit longer. So pressures around the industries are going to remain as we still have this adjustment to the new world of COVID-19, even though we are going through a recovery phase. Um, you'll be also seeing in the backdrop, this, this, this is still very, very relevant. Um, and we're going to have to talk, think a bit more deeply about this very issue, and that is the growth in China. The Chinese growth, as we can see outlined in this chart, is going to be significantly significant for things such as animal proteins, dairy, all those areas where the um, growth in incomes is going to be matched against the change in consumption is leading to big changes there. Even levels around wheat as the diet changes and becomes less traditionally Chinese and a little bit more Western, i.e. moving more towards bread and pizzas, you get this sort of lift in wheat demand as well. The one that stands out as net is different is, of course, rice, which has been the fundamental staple for so long. So this big backdrop of Chinese growth is still going to remain there, even with these near-term shocks that we've experienced. And it is going to provide uh, the ongoing opportunities that we've always expected. However, we have learned a very, very important lesson through that, and that is the concentration. Just before I sort of move on to that, I should be highlighting a little bit more sort of the longer run trends that this does highlight. And that focus on product on, on animal proteins is still driving this onward upward trend in inflation adjusted prices for beef. And that trend still has got a number of years to run until their diets become much more protein based, or we see a, a large substitution of animal based proteins for synthetically produced proteins. This is definitely clearly a risk moving forward as we improve technologies. The Chinese are investing heavily in that. We've already seen the evolution of um, uh, animal protein free burgers and that growth rate growth is still there continuing. One of the key reasons that 
you do not want to be in the bulk animal protein market. You want to be in the premium end, which is identified as something different and something that people pay a premium for. Because of course, the counterfactual, and this is still not gone away, even with the environment of experience of strong growth, is that grain prices adjusted for inflation still remain on a downward slide. That is to do with rising productivities around grain production, also to do with the fact that grain is a staple of the much of the poorer environment, poorer population of the world, and they cannot sustain a meaningful rise. So a lot of work is done investing on maintaining output and feeding the poor, and that of course means prices remain lower. And that is not going to be a fundamental change in the near run. So this split between animal proteins and, and, and bulk grains is going to remain, remain a key story message going on forward. And as we've always said, if you want to be in the grains game, it's all about productivity and efficiency. The thing that I was highlighting before a little earlier about China and I was sort of hinting towards is the issue around concentration. And we're now seeing it with the fact that how we've been using and leveraging into the growth in China in such a big way of putting all your eggs in one basket. Now, I'm not saying we should ignore China, and I totally understand why companies and individuals see rapid growth in one area and get in there in a very big way, but we also have to understand the risks associated with it. And we are seeing it now as the trade disputes broaden between Australia and China, and we're seeing some of our produce start to be implemented. You can see here now that the, out, of, out of the world's trade in agricultural produce, 45% of it goes to six countries, and roughly speaking, 21% of it goes to China. So they are now dominating the market and we do have to be there. But we should also be very conscious of being able to be small and nimble. The advantage we have in being a small agricultural producer is that we don't need big markets. So as long as we can find somewhere that is profitable and ongoing, we can be there and compete. So this is going to be part of the ongoing process of the next few years, not just how we leverage China, but also how we manage our risk profile and distribute the risk a little bit more broadly spread rather than putting all our eggs into one basket and being at the mercy of that one market. Now, the Australian economy back here, we talked earlier about those issues that were already there, the issues around household finances and household debt, the low levels of income growth, the low levels of productivity, and of course, falling house prices that we were experiencing all before COVID-19. COVID-19 is going to have, is had had, and will have an ongoing impact on the Australian economy. And one of the easiest ways I find to understand it is talk about it through the labour market. We are now seeing here the unemployment rate beginning to rise quite rapidly, and we think it's going to be somewhere around a little bit more than 8%. Um, we are seeing some help. Uh, the, the, without a doubt, job seeker, job keeper had a really meaningful impact on sort of in helping to hold down the unemployment rate. And I can show you some numbers that give you the numbers magnitudes. Job seekers providing a massive degree of support and also in degrees in terms of the unemployment rate has kept some people out of the labour market. On the job seeker program, you do not have to look for work. So there's people who are getting quite well benefits and they're not looking for work. Again, holding down the unemployment rate. But as you can see, because of the nature of that, as the recovery happens, a lot of the recovery will come through hours worked and not through pure jobs. As the recovery happens and job seekers getting changed back towards more like the New Start program, lower levels of lower levels of support plus more strict conditions around it, people will come back into the workforce and participation. Both those factors will lead to a higher level of unemployment and means it will be higher for longer. And at the end, we've got a higher level of unemployment. Every recession has left a legacy of unemployment. The recession of the of the early early nineties um, left us eight and a half years to get through it. The recession that came through from um, the late, sorry, from the um, 80s, it took eight years. From the 90s, it was 15 years before we got unemployment back down again. And then from the GFC, after 12 years, we still hadn't got back down to where we were. So you can see this legacy of unemployment is going to be an ongoing factor. And it is one of the reasons why we work so hard to try and keep unemployment down. It's a long building legacy that, that sort of damages human capital. It leaves people on, on outside the economy for, outside the productive economy for too long and, and pre help, prevents and hinders them getting back in. This time, however, there's going to be another leading, leading legacy and that is underemployment. That too is rising with this is going on. Underemployment is those who are employed that are looking for more work. On that basis, we can see this remaining relatively elevated, suggesting there's going to be quite a bit of slack in the economy i.e. there's not going to be a lot of pressure around for wages. So we've got this backdrop of 
slow employment growth, low wages growth, you can see where I'm going, low income story. There's a, it's really hard to find a strong fundamental growth story in Australia that can be based around domestic factors. And looking at where the shocks came through, what was really interesting is this shock was different this time is it concentrated more around um, hospitality, so the accommodation and um, retail, accommodation and recreation, uh, restaurants, food pro food services, all those areas around the sort of services side was where the shutdowns hit hardest. And as you see in this chart, those sectors were ranking more those most exposed. They had the lowest margins, they had the highest level of debt, highest levels of leverage, um, mo most degree of um, risks around employment. Those big sectors which employ a lot of people, that's the width of those red bands, were the ones who were also really highly exposed financially and being hit hard by this um, COVID-19 shock. Again, you can see why there's high degrees of support going in the sectors and there's going to be need some, some help for adjustment as we come out of it. It is not going to be a smooth sailing process as we come out and we try and remove the job seeker, job keeper and other supports that are there. And of course, when it comes to wages, we're just talking here about wages and incomes. The nominal level of wages have been growing quite slowly below the longer run average. They recently got back to around 2%, but the real number adjusted for inflation is pretty close to zero. And now we're talking about slower wages growth. And of course, in the near term, inflation has been a bit more muted, but that too will recovery. And there's not a lot of messages out there saying we can get strong wages growth. So this is where you get the tension between micro and the macro. On the micro level, you can argue that the minimum wage is too high and it's restraining growth and employment. But on the macro level, you can say, well, the minimum wage is too low because it's not stimulating growth and consumption. We're allowing our economy to stagnate. And this is the tension that we're going to continue to experience this year. We've seen the minimum wage increase this year, um, be reduced from previous years. That's, that, that's going to see this level of wages growth slow even further and maybe even go negative. So again, the micro, you can understand on a firm level why you need to keep wages down, but on a macro level, it has very strong implications around um, how you view growth and consumption. Now our forecasts, We're trying to bring all this together and think about where it lies, one of the key ones in terms of our impact on, on for our export sector is what is going to happen with the Australian dollar. And we've been seeing the Australian dollar perform quite well of late as the US Federal Reserve has been throwing a lot of liquidity at supporting their own economy. They cut the rates, interest rates as low as they could go. Now they're focusing on providing liquidity. They're providing um, buying government bonds to support uh, lower interest rates in the bond market, basically putting more US dollars into the market, resulting in a weaker US dollar. We've actually seen, in the, even with that environment, the Australian dollar is, relatively speaking, it's recovered but underperforming relative fair values. If you look at the price of commodities and how well they've been performing, if you look at our relative net debt position, which is improving because our trade position has been improving, if you look at relative interest rates where we're still relatively speaking a little higher than the US, the Australian dollar should be much closer towards 70 cents. I mean towards 75 cents rather than trading closer to 70 cents. And this is where we see this nexus, this global environment with this area of risk this small open economy of Australia has been seen to be a little bit more risky. You're linked to China, you're linked to exports that are growing, that have been handled by COVID. Therefore, you have a, a discount on you. As the global economy improves through next year, as a quantitative easings around the world from the European Central Bank, the US Central, the US Federal Reserve is actually pulled back, we actually see the Australian dollar going through a recovery phase and going back in towards fair value. So the risk margin coming out. And that gets us up to around the 75 cents. So you can see here where the risks lie. If that risks and uncertainty around the global, around the economy and us remains, the Australian dollar can continue to underperform fair value. But if something happens to improve it, it can snap back very quickly into a higher level. Counterfactually, if you want to see it go lower, you need to see a big crashing in commodity prices or a big surge in um, uncertainty around Australia, which would be associated with a deeper, more painful recession. So I think for all of us, what we're sort of really hoping for is an Australian dollar that's got a perception around risk that keeps it lower than fair value, but not one that's associated with a very bad outcome for the Australian economy. And so our forecasts, just highlighting in this environment, the RBA remains 
on the cash rate side on the sidelines. They are, however, operating very actively in the short end of the bond market when they need to, to keep the three-year bond rate around the cash rate of around 3%. And they're going to be trying to do that for around three, around three years. Um, that's, that's sort of their broad guidance. Of course, over time, we're already looking for the interest rates to improve in the US. They'll put pressure on our rates. As we get forward, each three-year bond is looking forward three years. So as we move forward, you'll see a gradual rise in the three-year bond rate. And of course, the 10-year bond rates are levering off what's going in the US. So net-net, a gradual drift higher in market interest rates, but nothing significant. Um, meanwhile, by the cash rates on hold, and you'll see underneath the Australian dollar, we see drifting towards 76 cents by the end of next year, and then easing back from there. That's all around that story that I was talking about, that tension between us being undervalued because of the risks associated with us, and the belief that things will improve or get us back up into fair value. Now, in a, in a sort of broad conclusion sense, uh, the, the pandemic does appear to be being brought globally under some form of control. Um, there are hotspots and points of concern, which makes us believe we should be, shouldn't be too hubristic about this all. Uh, the rising rates of infection that are going through the US now is a very, very humbling um, statistic. Or one of also watching to the rapid rise of infections that we're now experiencing in Latin America, and particularly Brazil, is giving us the idea that we could be we can't be sanguine that there's no risk of a second wave out there. We should also be very conscious of this ongoing trade conflicts, which we will not be immune to. Yes, centers mostly around US and China, but as we've seen, Australia and China are also finding a new path and it's not going to be easy. Just highlighting that today um, is the first day of the new laws associated with um, Hong Kong and the legislation around controlling uh, protests there. Um, China is definitely recovering faster than we anticipated. That is set in the backdrop that's quite positive for certain commodities. And we are really sort of seeing that ongoing growth and demand for agricultural produce to remain there and be there for a number of years going forward from here, well into our profile for 2030. However, we do sort of highlight those risks around it. If you're thinking about the more broader service-based profile and trying to think about agricultural products going into things like hospitality, retail, things that are linked with the tourism sector, that sector is looking like it's not going to reopen in any meaningful way, well, start reopening mid next year, and won't have any meaningful growth until mid 22. So you're talking about a very long drawn out process and that will not be the feeder. Production will now have to be diverted through to other sorts of commercial retail sites. Um, we are seeing some shifts around the risks around what individual countries are wanting to do as well, which must be considered. Shifting demand profiles are also being matched with shifting things around sovereign risks and the idea is that sovereigns want to be a little bit more um, cautious and secure with their food supplies. And also we've seen the breakdown of sort of the World Trade Organization based global agreements around trade to individual bilateral arrangements, which while I can produce some good one-to-one -one outcomes, do not produce the broad deepening of global free trade. And it's one which is going to constrain global growth. And I think that's one where Australia actually has a role to play and can be fight fortuitous. We are a small player in the agricultural markets. Um, we are very niche. We can target niche markets, which allows us to be a little bit more nimble and dealing within those smaller, more um, fragmented markets than someone big and cumbersome like the US or Canada or European Union. So we have some opportunities here. We just need to be more pragmatic quick and nimble and be a little bit more forward linking, thinking with these things. And I do think we should end on a positive note. Um, I think that lift in agricultural employment is a really unexpected sign, unexpected sign that both people are willing to invest in employing people and they're finding the people with the skills necessary to, to bring them back in industry. And there's people wanting to work in those sectors. For a long time, there was a lot of concern about what's going to happen in regional Australia and how you shape growth, um, how you provide the labour force to, to support the agricultural industry. This, along with signs that we're seeing the generational change happening in farming now, I see a lot more younger farmers around nowadays um, at, at conferences and on field days. And these are all positive signs we're going through a new change. And given the fact that the world we're operating in is changing, I think it's very, very an opportune time. And that both can come together and by 2030 we have a very different industry and one that's more in tune with this more diverse and fragmented 
global world. Now, of course, I need to do a bit of quick promotion. Westpac IQ, you can type Westpac IQ into the Google, Google search and you'll find it, is our home for all our research. Um, you can also look up for Westpac Wire as well, which is much more your newspaper style. Westpac IQ is our economics. Westpac Wire, more your broader newspaper magazine style um, articles. And of course, my very, very important disclaimer, which is about um, that I'm offering general, not specific advice. And of course, that you should not try and sue me in any of the jurisdictions that we are operating in. But more importantly, you're all very aware, and you've seen me do this a few times about the general specific advice I'm here. I think the much more pragmatic way to talk about it is through our research and our publications, we are trying to present what we think is the most likely scenario. Um, we don't have perfect vision. We're not giving you advice on what you think is going, to, on what we what think is definitely going to happen, but provide you with a scenario and some options around risk to help you think about the future and how you manage your own personal risk. On that basis, I should bring this together. I will highlight that I'm very open to taking questions. Um, my email address is jsmirk at westpac com.au or you can reach out to Gary Northover at the Tractor Machinery or Mim Malkovich. Both of them will be able to help you in terms of getting in contact with me with any questions you may have. Um, and I'd also love like to th again just finally thank um, Gary and the team at the TMA for inviting me back to come and try and present a little bit more of this um, support for their annual conference and try something new doing this sort of webcast rather than having a, a live conference in person. This is the new world. The world is changing on us. Um, the global environment is changing for all of us. I think we all got to try new things and get there and be adventurous. And doing that, we can all create new opportunities for us all. So I thank you and I wish you all the best for 2021.